so yeah, we, we've been working on this idea of inoculation or pre-bunking and, and how to get people to be more resistant to misinformation about science uh, and other topics. Um, and, you know, I don't have to tell, you know, you guys, of course, that uh, uh, conspiracy theories about the coronavirus have been uh, flourishing here in the UK. People have set over 50 phone masks on fire because of the false link between 5G and conspiracy theories. In Iran, people have died because they're drinking uh, methanol and alcohol-based products because they think um, that it's curing the virus, including many children. Um, in the United States, particularly, we see a lot of the uh, anti-vaccination movement active in the um, uh, in the COVID space. That you know, vaccines going to change your your DNA. Uh, one of my favorite examples in the, in the UK here is the disappearing needle. So these are videos which prefer to show that the needle disappears when you get the vaccine. Um, uh, the Ukraine conflict is another example, right? This was posted on Facebook, huge number of shares that, you know, military convoy heading to Ukraine. I mean, this is the, the West Coast of the United States. This is a total uh, shallow fake. You know, Putin's been putting out lots of, uh, lots of, lots of claims. Uh, we have QAnon, the Capitol riots. Um, so, you know, misinformation, I think, is obviously an issue that affects so many different dimensions of, of society. Um, but how do we sort of measure um, how susceptible people are. And, and so before I jump into our interventions, I think it's a little bit helpful to, to clarify um, where we're coming from with our paradigms, because, you know, we, the research we do is slightly different in our philosophy than, than other research. So, you know, one approach that many scientists take, and it's, you know, totally legitimate, um, is to use uh, a list of fact-checked news articles from Snopes of Litifact to decide what's true and what's fake. Um, so nothing wrong with that, but you know, only a very, very small portion of news is fact-checked, and so you know, you get this snippet of, of obviously fake stuff. Um, whereas we think the you know the, the big bulk of the problem is actually with, with media manipulation more generally. That tends to be more subtle uh, rather than the stuff that's obviously true and obviously fake, like flat Earth. Um, and so another way is to look at the source. Um, so a lot of research classifies what's true or false based on whether the publisher is dodgy. And there's a lot of known producers of unreliable content. Um, so we're not using these type of definitions. We're focusing more on the presence or absence of common techniques that are used to produce misinformation. And we've been analyzing and cataloging these techniques for quite a long time now. Um, and so we, I'm not talking about true or false in a binary sense, but we want to help people calibrate their judgments as a function of media manipulation that uses these techniques more, more generally. So let me give you an example. So this is a stimuli from, from mainstream research, and there's nothing wrong with this. Again, you know, this was fact-checked. I mean, vitamin C doesn't protect against coronavirus. Uh, Health Impact News is a dodgy source. Um, so by all means, this, this is considered false. Um, but here's another example. Um, healthy doctor died two weeks after getting a COVID vaccine. CDC is investigating why. Now, technically, these two events did happen. A healthy doctor died, and it was two weeks after getting the vaccine. The problem is that these events might be totally independent, right? One might have nothing to do with the other, but the insinuation here, uh, the framing technique that's being used is to get people riled up about the vaccine. Now, the Chicago Tribune is a very reputable outlet in the United States. And so based on of these, some of these definitions, you wouldn't say that this is fake news, but in our framework, uh, this clearly involves a misinformation technique. Um, and so what we want to do is help calibrate people's judgment. So when mainstream outlets use it, but also when fringe outlets use it. Um, and so that's just kind of, you know, we're focusing more on the purposeful spread here of, of misinformation, often called disinformation or propaganda when it's political rather than just misinformation, even though, you know, everyone uses these terms to, to talk about the issue of fake news. So, you know, when you look at the, the main response from institutions, international organizations, social media companies, they're all heavily relying on fact checking and verification. And, and again, I think fact checking is a good thing, but it has some limitations. And meta analyses in, in uh, cognitive science and psychology have, have illustrated, uh, and science communication have illustrated a number of limitations when it comes to debunking and fact checking after the fact. And um, I think that the three key ones here are one, is the, the fact that misinformation continues to influence us even when we acknowledge a correction or having seen a correction. This is called the continued influence of misinformation effect. Uh, and it's very persistent. So because misinformation integrates in our memories and makes friends in our associative networks and links to other concepts that we know, 
you, it becomes very difficult to correct. You can't just deactivate a node in people's memory and then people forget about it. That's not how it works. Um, so when people, when we try to correct things, often what happens is that either people fail to integrate the correction or there's a retrieval error that people somehow keep retrieving the myth uh, instead of the correction. And so, you know, when you debunk something, you're forced into the rhetorical frame of the misinformation. You have to repeat it and say that it's not true, which sometimes can inadvertently strengthen people's memory connections with the myth and then people fail to integrate the, the correction. And so you have to make the corrections really prominent relative to the misinformation. Um, so that's a challenge. Um, then the other thing is just practical. You know, fact checks, they don't scale to the same level as misinformation does. You know, misinformation goes viral, social media engagement with fact checks tends to be limited. Uh, it takes weeks to produce a fact check, while it can take two seconds to float misinformation. So we're never sort of keeping up with, um, with the amount of misinformation out there using this approach. And then sometimes it can backfire. You know, this is not so big of a concern anymore, given all of the research that shows that you know, backfire effects only tend to happen among the ideologically extreme. Um, so maybe that's not a concern for most people, but sometimes, you know, people get upset when you fact check them. So for all of these reasons, we've been trying to flip this approach on its head and, and do pre-bunking instead of debunking to try to protect people preemptively before they're exposed um, through a process known as psychological inoculation. For those who are familiar with this, it was first developed by McGuire in the 60s. McGuire is a social psychologist who kind of worked on this topic. And I think one of the key insights he had at the time was that um, this was during the Korean War and people were concerned about brainwashing and things like that. And, you know, the, the, the sort of the response was people need more facts. They need to understand the values and of, of, of Western democracies and so on. And, you know, that's that's why they're being brainwashed by foreign troops and, so, and things like that. But McGuire said, no. That's not the reason. The reason is people haven't been exposed to a weakened dose, a simulation of the types of attacks that they might be facing. Um, and that's why they don't have any mental antibodies. And so he developed this, this analogy and then stopped researching it altogether um, in, in, in the 60s. But it seems so relevant to, uh, to what's going on in the world today. So for those who are not familiar, I'll explain the inoculation analogy uh, quickly. So just like a regular vaccine, when you inject people with a weakened or inactive, inactive strain of a virus, the body starts to produce antibodies to help confer immunity against future infection. And it turns out you can do the same with information by preemptively exposing people to a weakened dose of misinformation or the techniques that are used to produce misinformation. People can build up these cognitive antibodies um, over time uh, and become more resistant to them. And so sometimes people split this into an effective basis uh, which is relating to the role of uh, threat or forewarning people of that they might be deceived, which is supposed to kickstart our psychological immune system. And then there's the cognitive basis or the reputational preemption. So you preemptively refute, which we've renamed uh, pre-bunking because it's easier for people to, uh, to understand. Uh, the relative importance of these two elements is debated, but um, I think they both have their, their role. Um, so when we first came out with this study in the context of climate change, so we decided to pick up where McGuire sort of left off because uh, he never really tested this in the context of misinformation or propaganda. Um, he sort of played around with issues like, you know, brushing your teeth twice a day is, is a good thing. And what if you're attacked on that notion? Um, people don't have any defenses because they've never considered that they might be attacked on such a belief. And so we could try to bolster people's attitude by inoculating them. Um, and so we, we thought, well, let's let's test this in a really contested sort of environment, uh, especially in the U.S., where people are very polarized on issues such as climate change. Um, and, you know, the news came out with these headlines. Cambridge scientists consider fake news vaccine. It's possible to vaccinate Americans. Uh, um, you know, one journalist calls us and asks if this is fake news. Um, so I said, you know, read the article. You decide um, to, to sort of walk you through it. Um, I'll show you this, this lab experiment first because it's very controlled and it explains the tenets of inoculation uh, quite clearly. Uh, uh, this is from quite a while ago now though, and then I'll move on to some of our field interventions and games and uh, interactive ways that we've developed to, to engage in people. So with this intervention, we were looking at for a long time, you know, before 2016, before the whole fake news thing, we were very much inspired by this idea uh, from Naomi Oreskes, who's now a science historian at Harvard, uh, who covered this sort of strategy um, that the tobacco and fossil fuel industry is used for decades to manufacture doubt about science. And this was to obscure the link between smoking and disease, but also between fossil fuels and CO2 emissions. Um, and we started realizing that this is a repeated technique 
that's being used by these actors to try to sow doubt about scientific consensus. Um, so here's an example from the tobacco industry. They would dress up uh, a doctor or somebody in a, in a doctor's in a white coat and say, oh, more doctors smoke camel than any other cigarette to try to influence people. Um, and um, you can see here the, the ad that they, that they ran. Uh, it wasn't, uh, took a long time, but I think in 2017, the US court ordered that they had deceived people for decades intentionally, and they had to run a corrective uh, ad campaign uh, ordered by the courts in the United States. And of course, these research shows that, you know, very few people saw the corrective ads about smoking and disease and people didn't engage with them because the damage had already been done. Um, and that's why I think this preemptive approach is, uh, is so useful. So um, there's a leaked memo from the Bush administration, uh, early 2000s, about the advice that, you know, they need to continue to make a lack of scientific certainty a primary issue in the debate because, you know, doubt is their product. Um, and, uh, one of the most viral stories on social media at that time was about how a petition showed that climate change was a hoax because thousands of scientists had signed it saying global warming isn't, isn't real. So we thought, well, what if we could inoculate people against that sort of content? And so in this first experiment, what we did is we exposed people to the scientific consensus on climate change in one condition. This was a very, very straightforward message. You know, 97% of scientists agree, very simple for people to remember and rehearse. So that was sort of the, the clean facts. This was a pre-post experiment about 2,000 uh, Americans. Um, people were asked to make judgments about lots of different topics, Angelina Jolie, uh, you know, so, so pe people didn't catch on to the fact that we were interested in their attitudes about climate change. So this is the pre-post change in people's perception after we show them the facts. You know, most people update towards the facts when they're shown them uh, in a vacuum. And so this is, this is positive news, but, you know, criticisms are fair that, you know, oh, well, this, uh, you know, this isn't how the real world operates. People don't see facts in a vacuum. And I think that's totally fair. You know, when we show people this petition, this is a real petition, by the way. This is this, the Oregon petition. This is, act, this is an active website. 30,000 scientists have signed this petition. People become more doubtful of the scientific consensus when they're exposed to the to this information. What we didn't anticipate, though, is when we paired the two together, and this was to sort of portray the false balance we often saw in the media, including by mainstream outlets like the BBC, who've apologized and reverted their policies, but for a long time, they would invite contrarians on to, next to a climate scientist to make sure that the debate is even keeled, even though there was a clear scientific consensus. What was so shocking though, is when you introduce the, the contrarian information, it completely canceled out the power of facts. It nullified it, zilch. Um, and so this was this was quite concerning about the power of misinformation on, uh, that it can have. And so we decided, well, can we prevent this from happening? Can we inoculate people? And so what we did in one of the conditions is that we just forewarn people that there's political actors trying to deceive them on the issue of climate change and they use specific techniques to do so. Um, and that helped a little bit. So you can see the, the partial vaccine um, preserved about one third of the effect of, uh, uh, of, of the simple facts here. And the detailed vaccine, sorry, um, we, we we did a, a preemptive reputation, a kind of a detailed pre-bunk. So we told people, look, there's petitions out there that use this fake expert technique. But if you look at who signed it, it includes people like Charles Darwin, the Spice Girls, you know, there's Dr. Gary Halliwell on there. It's totally unverified this petition. Fact checkers have rated it, pants on fire. Um, you shouldn't fall for this kind of thing. Um, and so, you know, when that's combined with the full warning and the preemptive refutation, uh, there was a, a bigger effect. So that about two thirds of the original effect of the facts was preserved when people were inoculated. Now, this is not full immunity, uh, but clearly there's a, there's an advantage to, to inoculation here. So here are the standardized effect sizes for people who want to see those. Uh, and the beauty, I think, for this experiment was that even though Republicans and and and, and Democrats had different reactions to climate you know, information in the experiment, as you would expect in a polarized society, um, the patterns were the same for the inoculations. So I, I don't think we've changed the mind of skeptics here, but what we were able to do is neutralize them from integrating further misinformation into their worldview. So even people who were skeptical about climate change didn't fall for the misinformation. And so that was a, a kind of a, a new way um, of, uh, of conceptualizing the benefits of inoculation, that even when it's not purely prophylactic, it can still have therapeutic uh, sort of benefits. Now, we did a, a pre-registered replication of this study uh, with one twist. I'm not going to rock you through it. It's a, the exact same experiment. Um, but now we attack people one week later, right? So we inoculated people at time one. And then the attack, or the, it sounds a bit nefarious, but the, this website petition didn't come 
um, until a week after. And so what we found, interestingly, was that at baseline, if you were in the facts only or the balanced, false balance or the inoculation condition, you've only seen the facts in the inoculation at this point. So everyone's updating their perceptions of the scientific consensus by about 10 percent points, which is a, a nice jump. But then a week later, when they're attacked and saying, oh, this is fake news and, and here are all these scientists saying global warming isn't happening. What you see is interesting is that, you know, compared to the false balance condition, yeah, you, you're inoculated here and also compared to the control group, there's a much smaller sample so that the error bars are wider. But what's so interesting to me is that it's the same, you're at the same level as, as the consensus condition. So why, why is that useful? So remember, in the consensus condition, people only saw the facts. They were never attacked uh, a week later. They only saw the facts. So what's interesting is that if you only see the facts, the effect decays naturally by about 50% over the course of a week. It goes from you know nine to four. Um, so even in the absence of any misinformation, people seem to be distracted and forgetting the facts. And so, um, but if you are inoculated, you end up in the same place as if there had been no misinformation at all, just the natural decay of, of the facts. And so another way to think about this is that, you know, there was no decay of the inoculation uh, over the course of a week. Now, for people who are interested in, in this sort of what we call issue-based inoculation, which is specific issues like climate change, we have a bunch of review uh, inoculation theory in the post-truth era. There was a nice article on PNES about our journey in, in fact, finding a vaccine for, for misinformation. Um, but we decided to um, really um, step things up a notch. And uh, we realized that getting people to read text is very passive. So this is what we call passive inoculation. The experimenter gives the participants the counter arguments that they can use preemptively to build resilience. But we thought, what if we could you know, let people actively generate their own antibodies and their own counter arguments. Um, and, you know, people think science is boring. So how can we make it more interesting? How can we actually do this in the real world? Because a lot of journalists were sort of saying, oh, nice idea, but how can you scale this, right? You can't pre-bunk every single story. Um, how are people going to engage with this? And so we took some inspiration from the Harry Potter novels from Severus Snape, who said, your defenses must be as flexible and inventive as the arts that you seek to undo. Um, and so I think that was a great quote. Um, and so what we did was we tried to gamify this approach, which was the first innovation, make it interactive, make it active, experiential learning. Two, it's a public engagement tool. Three, it's, it's a research tool also. But most importantly, four, we decided to move away from inoculating people against specific issues and scale it up a level to talk about the general techniques that are used to produce misinformation. because. Our hypothesis was maybe we can go from a narrow spectrum vaccine to a broad spectrum vaccine. So if we inject, quote unquote, with a virtual needle, inject people with the inoculation that dismantles a particular technique, like a fake expert or conspiracy theory or, or polarization, then it doesn't matter what misinformation people are exposed to. As long as it uses that technique, people are going to be immune, relatively speaking. So that was our hope. Um, so we produced uh, bad news. The game is called bad news. It's a pun. Um, and the idea here is to, uh, to gain as many followers as possible uh, while building uh, a, your own fake news empire and learning about um, some of the techniques that are used to, uh, to produce this information. Um, and here you can see John, John Rosenbeek, who's a postdoc, then graduate student who's been with the lab since its inception. And you can see he's not so amused by the questions from the CNN journalists about uh, how, the, how, the, how the game works, but you know he, he's really a genius behind uh, a lot of what I'm about to show you. Um, so here's the interface, right? And so um, here's your follower meter, here's your credibility meter. Here you're impersonating Donald Trump. After long deliberation with my generals, I've decided to declare war in North Korea, hashtag Kim Jong Dun. Um, and so this is not something Trump actually said, but something he could have said. This was live during his presidency. Um, I think that the key thing is that we've manipulated the Twitter handle. So it's an N instead of an M. Most people fail to notice this. It's part of the technique called impersonation, which includes fake experts, but also impersonating celebrities, politicians, um, uh, public health organizations. And so most people fail to recognize this on the pretest, but once they've been inoculated against the technique in the game, they can now spot it on, on the, uh, the post-test. So what are these techniques? They're polarization, impersonation, conspiracy theories, trolling, uh, emotion, like fear mongering uh, about vaccines, uh, moral outrage, uh, discrediting fact checkers uh, and, and others, you know, your fake news. So there's more out there, but these are the, the six big ones that, that we started with. Um, and so, you know, once you gain a level, you go to the next and then at the end you, you get your certificate. Um, 
Now, the content in the game is fictional because you know we don't want to do people with, with actual fake news, but it's all fictional. Um, but it's based on reality, so that it has ecological validity. So you know, there was this guy impersonating Warren Buffett. You can see here the T is missing. I had hundreds of thousands of followers in no time, and it was tweeting out all sorts of nonsense like, "Oh, investing what makes you happy." Um, and so the, the the Trump tweet is based on that. So it's different from reality, but but based on, on real events. So. The way we tested people in the game initially was that we would give them a series of tweets that use these techniques, different from what people saw in the game, but same technique. So this was during Game of Thrones. So, you know, eight seasons of hashtag Game of Thrones postponed due to a salary dispute. Um, this was during Game of Thrones. So, you know, very disappointed by the ending of all of it. Uh, I'm still making up my mind about House of Dragons that's, uh, that's come out recently. But um, um, uh, so basically what uh, what's happening here is that the umlaut is... Uh, is manipulated uh, and so we, we ask people how reliable they find this content and the hope is that you know people find misinformation that makes use of these techniques less reliable after after playing the game johnson crude oil is trolling leo dicaprio here snow and freezing in new york with you some of that global warming you're always going on about so that's part of the trolling technique um now we published a paper on this we when the game went live you know we had millions of people play it and so about 10 percent opted in the scientific research and so we had uh, in the first few months, we had about 30,000 data points or 15,000 people. Um, and so when we give people real news items that don't use these techniques, people find it reliable before and after playing. But for the items that use these techniques, people find it significantly less reliable. Um, uh, here you can see the whole distributions. Uh, it didn't really matter if you were left, right, young, old, lower, higher educated. There was some small variation here, but mostly the intervention effect was, was pretty similar, even though people start at different levels in terms of their uh, susceptibility. Now, um, there were issues with this study, right? It was uh, in the wild. Uh, it wasn't perfectly controlled. We didn't have a control group. Um, and so one of my students, Melissa, decided to do a, a randomized replication with the gamified control group this time. So we had people, people play uh, Tetris. We got one email saying, is that what Cambridge has come to, asking people to play Tetris for 20 minutes? But yes, if you were in the control group, we were happy to, uh, to do that. Uh, we have many more items this time, also because the game engine slows down when we survey people too much, and so we could only ask a few basic questions. And so we took it out of the gaming environment in Qualtrics this time, and we have you know a whole battery of fake items that we ask people to judge. Um, and Melissa had this great idea, and she she loves puns, and so the title of the paper was "Good News About Bad News." Um, and and the idea here was that. Um, she said, well, you know, it's interesting that the game helps people spot misinformation, but it would also be important to boost people's confidence, because if you're not very confident in what you believe, you're easily persuaded of something else, right? And so um, basically we wanted to see if it also boosts people's ability in their own truth discernment abilities. And so here what I'm showing you is the average of 18 items, three per technique. There were six techniques, so 18 items. People find the fake news significantly less reliable in the inoculation group. These, these are violent plots with the jitter uh, of the data. Um, you can see the distribution here, the density shifts to the left, meaning it's less reliable. Um, so that's good. But people also became more confident in their ability to spot misinfo. And only when they updated in the right direction here. So, you know, there, there were some jokers, obviously, in the data set, uh, as you always have. But um, for people who correctly um, judged the post to be less reliable, they became more confident. But not when people gave the wrong answers. And, uh, you know, we're not making people overconfident because that, that could also be a concern. Now, Raccoon, who's another student of mine, did another pre-registered replication, but this time looking at the longevity of the effect, um, which is a very important question. He sort of said, okay, interesting, we can inoculate people against these techniques in a broad spectrum way. You know, we dismantle conspiracy theories, we show people in the simulation uh, how the sausage is made, um, and then we bombard them with different versions of conspiracy theories and they all find them less reliable. But if that only lasts for a few seconds, you know, that, that'd be a shame. So we wanted to see um, how long it lasts. So here you can see scientists discovered solution to greenhouse effect years ago, aren't allowed to publish it. Um, so this is part of the conspiracy technique. Um, now, the long-term effectiveness of this approach, uh, we did three studies. I'm not going to run you through all because our paradigms are always the same. So we have people come in, do the pretest, We randomize them into treatment control. Then they do the post-test. And then we started following up with people one week later, two weeks later, three weeks later, four weeks later, all the way to two months. Um, and, and it sounds nefarious, so sort of we attack them with the misinformation at every testing sort of period. Um, and then in the second experiment, exactly the same, we cut out all of the intermediate testing. We just followed up with people at the end of the two-month period. 
In the third experiment, we changed the test items at every uh, testing period. Because there were some reviewers who were like, maybe people are memorizing their answers to your questions. And maybe, I mean, I can barely remember what I had for dinner yesterday, but let's assume I remember my answers to 21 items a week later. Let's just exclude that possibility too. Um, so what you see here is um, nothing happening on the pretest between treatment and control. But then after the intervention, there's the, the, the effect. People found fake news less reliable. But it stayed that way week after week after week after week. Um, and so I said to recruit, I mean, it's not possible. Even with COVID, people need booster shots. And so something else is going on here. So what we saw in the second experiment was that if you don't engage with people, there's still a treatment effect at the end of the testing period after two months, but it's creeping back up. So people find fake news more reliable again. So there's significant decay happening here. Um, and so what we learned from this experiment actually is that we were boosting people in between by jogging their memory and their motivation uh, by engaging them on a weekly basis by, and rating these items and asking people about misinformation. And so we've later learned with some of our other experiments also that you can also boost people by re-exposing them to the game or a slideshow of it or some other way, but you need to engage people over time. Otherwise the effect does wane over time, like with some, some vaccines, people do lose uh, immunity. So at this point, we were fairly confident that we had something that was worth doing and so we decided to team up with the UK government who translated that news into pretty much every major language now. It started out with 20, uh, but it's, you know, it's pretty much every major language now in the world. Um, so we could do some large cross-cultural testing. We did Sweden. Patterns were very similar in Sweden as, uh, um, as in, uh, in the UK. We had Germany, Greece, Poland in, in one of our papers. Um, you can see there's some cultural variation, right? The effect size is slightly lower in Poland than in Greece. Uh, but, you know, we, didn't, we don't really have good reasons that could explain that. Uh, we did a, a handbook for NATO recently during the Ukraine-Russia war on how to implement inoculation uh, in, in the field. Um, it was in the museum for a while. Here you can see one of our victims. You know, all credit to the art, the artists and the designers uh, who won some awards for you know this being a, a retro kind of way to bring back uh, uh, some 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 gaming styles. And John won some awards that are very well deserved, I think, for. Uh, uh, spearheading this approach. We have a version for kids called Bad, Ju Bad News Junior, uh, which uses the same principles, but with much more age-appropriate content like SpongeBob and you're impersonating the high school principal, schools out, um, so things like that. So some of the last things I want to talk about is some of the real-world applications that we've done. So during the pandemic, we had an opportunity to do one with the UK government. They were thinking about their approach to countering disinformation, and we decided to do a, a huge inoculation campaign and they wanted a new game because you know bad news is like a 20 minute simulation it's it's a research tool for us but it's also a public engagement tool but you know ultimately the scale is in social media they wanted something that's much shorter so we did a five minute game called go viral uh, which is solely focused on pandemic misinformation COVID misinformation so the three techniques that we used here are uh, fake experts fake doctors fake nurses people peddling fake cures conspiracy from 5g to, to you know bill gates um, and then the use of emotions to get people riled up about vaccines and masks and, and things like that. And it works the same as bad news, um, but we were lucky that we could team up with the World Health Organization and the United Nations. And so we became part of their campaigns, which helped scale this, this whole approach to, uh, to a new level. So the UN was tweeting out um, the game and, and, and you can go to the WHO page to learn more about uh, the Go Viral campaign. Um, it works the same. So your Joel, this was at the start of the pandemic, you know, everything's going to hell, but the internet still works. And you join this group called Not Co Frayed, um, and you start spreading content that this global NGO is covering up that eating kiwis actually cures the virus. Again, you know, completely innocuous content, uh, but modeled after some of some of the real sort of events. So you go undercover in this character and learn about, uh, you know, University of Camford expert lizard people behind coronavirus outbreak, live virus particles found in terrariums. So you learn about the fake expert technique. Um, and, um, you know, we test people now in, in very similar ways. And so what we did for the, also, the, this was a real rollout. So we wanted to be extra careful here. So we had an in the wild study, the pre post live during our game, which is what we usually do in the testing phase. Um, and then we had a, 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 a randomized RCT trial parallel in the UK, France and, uh, Germany, um, to see how well this, this works. And this time we also added a passive control. So the UN was doing their own pre-bunking campaign on social media using infographics. So that's a passive way people have to read, right? They don't engage actively. So that was one uh, an additional control group that we uh, uh, that we had here. 
Um, so again, here's an example. Nobel laureate claims the virus is not natural. There's evidence suggesting it's man-made. How manipulative do you find this post? What we find in the, the paper that we published on this was that, yeah, you know, pre-post people find fake news overall more manipulative if it contains these techniques. Here's fake expert, here's emotion, here's conspiracy. Um, nothing happening for real news that doesn't use these techniques. You can see here though that, you know, people who opt into our interventions are obviously already good at spotting what's manipulative. And so that's why we do these randomized trials as well. So it's not fully opt-in. Um, so here you see when people played go viral, uh, the red bars are actually a, a one week follow-up. Um, there was a treatment effect here. Same for the infographics. So that the passive inoculation worked too, but there was a bigger effect for, for go viral. Um, and uh, there was no decay after, um, after one week. Um, there's some funky trend in the control group that people got better on their own over time, which could be due to repeated testing, but even controlling for that, uh, there was still a pretty, uh, pretty good effect. Uh, but looking at some of the mechanisms that we see, uh, so part of inoculation is the idea that people need to be motivated and feel threatened so that they take action. And so indeed we find that in the active version, people had higher motivational threats, so they were more motivated to defend themselves than in the other groups, and they were also more likely to want to share the, the vaccination. And so that's ultimately where we're going with this, is that you know the, the individual cognitive inoculation is interesting, but it only works, I think, on a societal level uh, if we can achieve herd immunity. So people need to share and talk about the inoculation once they've received it. Um, and so we found that people were more willing to talk about go viral um, after playing. I won't talk too much about this, but we, we did one in the political sphere with the uh, Department of Homeland Security in the US during the 2020 elections called Harmony Square. Um, it's about political disinformation and helping people spot foreign influence um, uh, techniques. It, it works very similar. There's a news broadcaster and you're spreading fake news during the election by uh, uh, making use of trolling and uh, and other and other techniques, and then the ratings drop of the political candidate. So people can see in real time how misinformation can affect elections. And then we test the people on this sort of real polarizing social media stuff you see in the U.S. You know, fathers don't deserve a day and Father's Day. Um, a Trump supporter accidentally got killed hunting with his son, and somebody commented, "You know, 1.5 less MAGA billies in the world." You know, real upsetting stuff that people get worked up over. But again, we found that people find it. You know, less reliable after playing, they're more confident and, and less willing to share this type of stuff with, with people in, in their network. Um, and so here's uh, John again at the UN uh, talking about, you know, the possibilities of, of implementing uh, pre-bunking. We've just put out a, a computer simulation of, of trying to understand how we can spread inoculation in social, when we have to deal with social media echo chambers, uh, for example. Um, and so we found some really interesting results that, you know, when you when you, when you have heavily polarizing echo chambers, sprinkling the inoculation over time is not that effective. You really want to front load users uh, and inoculate them before they're exposed to misinformation. So I think you know there's there's value in the preemptive metaphor. There's still therapeutic you know purposes to inoculation, but obviously it loses some of its effectiveness uh, the later you come into the uh, the process. And so the last thing I'll say in the last five minutes is um the latest study we've done to actually scale this in the real world. So we did a partnership with Google to try to scale this on social media. And Google said, look, it needs to be shorter still than five minutes in order to, to really get people on social media because you know people's attention span is short. Uh, we own YouTube, so maybe that's an interesting place to start by thinking about how we could implement this on, on YouTube. And one of the things we, uh, we did was we created videos. So, so Google said, look, let's do videos. It's not as interactive and active, but we can make them animated and fun. But we could scale this this more easily, and so you know the video starts that you know says you may be targeted. Uh, there's people out there trying to manipulate you, and then you know we give people an example of uh, of some of these techniques that are prevalent on YouTube. So YouTube is special because it doesn't deal with headlines and stuff, but there is political actors out there using rhetorical devices to get people to buy into extremist ways of thinking. So scapegoating minority groups. Uh, using false dilemmas, either you join jihad or you're not a good Muslim, for example, um, um, or um, uh, incoherence, which is a big a big deal of conspiracy theories. They're logically incoherent. Um, and so what we did was we show people some content, um, nothing controversial. So you know, we show people clips from Star Wars and Family Guy that makes use of these techniques. So we have a clip from the Revenge of the Sith. Uh, where, you know, Luke Skywalker is, is, you know, he's sort of saying like, oh, you're either my enemy, you're either with me or you're against me. And then he sort of says, only a Sith deals in absolutes. 
Uh, and that's how we illustrate the technique. Uh, in a safe way for social media companies because they don't want to be arbiters of truth, right? Um, but then we we test people with polarizing, you know, contested issues, contested science headlines, and we find that you know it does it does inoculate them. Um, so you can find all these videos on inoculation.science, um, and we just had a paper out where we evaluated this in, in six lab studies, all three registered, and one field study on YouTube. So we did this live on YouTube. YouTube put the videos in the ad space, you know, the annoying ads where you get on YouTube, that's where our video was. Um, and then we polled people within 24 hours on YouTube in the ad space to, and tested them to see if they could recognize misinformation in content. Um, and I'll show you the effects of that experiment here and that you know about 5 million people saw the ads uh, and about 22,000 people answered our survey. Um, and so um, you know, here, here's an example of the false dilemma. So, you know, why give illegal immigrants access to social services? We should, you know, be helping homeless Americans instead, right? And so this is the subtle stuff that we're more concerned about than like flat earth, right? It, it, you, can, you can help illegal immigrants and homeless Americans at the same time. It's not either or, but using a technique like that is very misleading. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, that's the sort of test that we tested people on. So 30% of the viewers were randomly selected to answer our questions. Um, within 24 hours of, of being exposed to the inoculation. Um, and then here are some of the results. You know, on average, we found that it boosted people's ability to spot these techniques by about 5 to 10% uh, in, in a real distracting YouTube environment. Um, doesn't sound like a lot, you know, a 5 to 10% boost. It's certainly smaller than the effect sizes we see in the lab. But, you know, if you compare this to what YouTube calls brand lifts, um, so these are usually used to measure. Uh, brand increases in brand recognition because that's what YouTube uh, social media advertising is all about. Um, in my experience um, working with these companies, not just YouTube, but also Facebook, WhatsApp, and, and, and Google, um, these lifts are very small, 1%, smaller than 1%. Uh, it can be big, but usually, you know, the lifts that you see from these ads are tiny. Um, and so 5% seemed actually pretty good um, for, for a field experiment like this. And of course, YouTube has the ability to, to scale this across billions of people if they made it mandatory in the ad space. Um, so that's where I'll leave this. I'm happy to do the last 15 minutes, have discussions with people. If people are interested, I wrote a review recently in Nature Medicine. Uh, thanks so much for listening.